the captain, Steven Stamkos, joins us the first episode of the year on the block party. I was doing this with Dan Girardi last season, and we were set up a couple of times to talk to you, and then practice got canceled, and then COVID happened. So I appreciate you taking some time to be our first episode this year. Uh, just right off the bat, because you're in Columbus, tell me what were your thoughts, uh, you know, what was going through your mind during the five-overtime game during the playoffs last season? Well, that was crazy. Um Obviously wish I was uh, a part of it. I think I was more stressed watching it than playing in those games. That's what anytime you're out of the lineup, that's usually what happens is you have actually, you can't do anything out on the ice. So you feel more stress. And uh, it was, it was crazy. I think we got to the rink. It was an afternoon game and it was like 10 o'clock at night. By the time we left, it was, it was crazy. But I tell people when they ask about the Stanley cup run, like that was a huge moment for us to, to win that game one because of what happened last year, just a mental hurdle really to, to get that win early. And um, it was kind of something that was a, a huge part of, of that cup run. Does this Stanley cup happen without the loss to Columbus the year before? You know what? That's, it's a great question. I think it, it definitely is a part of it. Um, we learned as, as a team what needed to be changed. We, we learned from that experience, um, certainly a chip on our shoulder heading into the year. And I think it allowed management too to maybe, you know, point out a few areas that we needed to improve on. And, you know, you got to give Julian credit. He went out and made some big trades and gave up some big assets to get, you know, certain players and not only the trades, but bringing in guys like Maroon and Shattenkirk and Shen. And then you add, you know, obviously Coleman and Goudreau at, at the deadline. Um, we had a, a, we had the same core group, but we added those guys and, and they were phenomenal for us. Did you, and, and the core seems to be growing each year with the lightning, you know, you cooch, you know, Hetty, Vazzy, then you throw, you know, McDonough in there, brain points, so it keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, what, did you start to feel the pressure that the core was, you know, not going to be able to get over that hump and get, get, get that Stanley cup. You certainly hear the outside noise for sure. And then, you certainly have a little tiny bit of that start to creep into your head that uh, like, man, are we, are we going to ever win this thing? We've been so close. Uh, we've had such a good team for a long time. You know, the preseason expectations are always there to win the Stanley cup. And I think it's not a bad thing to have those things creep into your mind because it motivates you. You know, you, you don't want to be that team that had all that potential and never, you know, got it done. So for sure. There's a sense of obviously a great accomplishment when you finally get that. There's a little sense of relief as well, because you know that uh, how hard it is to win, you know, you've been so close so many times and then to finally get it is there's just this kind of mountain of pressure that, that comes off your shoulders. And now you're just free. You, you go out there and you expect to win again and you know what it takes. And there's just this sense of calm and, I think guys can feel that this year and we've gotten off to obviously a great start. I'm going to, I'm going to bounce around all over the place with you. Cause I have like 12 yeah. years of questions to pack into, <laughs> you know, 30 minutes. Uh, I want to know, and I'll get back to the Stanley cup um, 2016 when you were a free agent um, you know, how close were you to possibly leaving Tampa Bay? Well, I knew in the bottom of my heart, I wanted to stay. Um, and I really didn't kind of stray from, from that mentality. Obviously when you get as far as I did along in, in kind of that free agent window uh, without signing, you know, you, you at least got to go through the process just to see what, see what's out there. Um, so I was able to, to do that, but, you know, deep down every night and stressful night that you'd think about possibly leaving, it just, it didn't seem right. It, it, it felt like I, I obviously love, you know, Tampa and the community and everything that uh, comes with it. You know, they've been first class and world class for, for me and my family since day one. I knew what I had here. And there was just that sense of unfinished business. You know, we had gone to the Stanley Cup final and, and you could see that core was still together and, and going to grow. And ultimately, that's what it came down to. I, I wanted to be in a place that you know, fit me and fit my family and also gave me the best chance to win. And I knew that was here in Tampa and it was just kind of uh, surreal to know that that decision was kind of cemented when, when we were able to win. 
Was it nice to at least be recruited by possibly every single team in the NHL though? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh it's, it's not a bad thing for your ego when you go through something <laughs> like that. Uh, you know what? You only get that opportunity, you know, maybe once or, or twice in your career. So uh, I was able to, to go through that. And like I said, see what's out there. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I knew deep down that I never wanted to leave Tampa and, and I'm sure glad I didn't. And I, I had the chance to interview you when you first got drafted by the lightning. And I asked you this question and we'll just reflect on it. When you first came to town, it was seen Stamkos all over the place. I mean, being in your position now as the captain and a veteran, you know, seeing if the lightning, you know, take a guy in the first round billboards for him all over town, that'd be crazy. You know, what, what's it like to reflect on how much hype there was, you know, just coming in before you even put a pair of skates on in Tampa. Yeah, there, there was a lot of hype. I'm not sure many people knew what Seen Stamkos even was, um, to, to be honest. We've come a long way in terms of this being, one, you know, one of the best, I've said it multiple times, one of the best hockey markets in, in the league. And I, I, I truly think that, but uh, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, they had those bumper stickers and everywhere. I think even, one of the sports networks in Toronto did a special and, and they were asking people on the beach, like, you know, have you seen Stamkos? And like half the people were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, we have no clue what you're talking about. So it was, I think in, in a way it was, it was really cool, uh, really unique, but you know, it wasn't as much pressure as maybe you'd think just because of, you know, h- hockey was still, I know they had won the cup in 04, but then the lockout happened. And, you know, my first couple of years, it, it, it really wasn't great in terms of the fan support and, you know, the direction of the team. And we went through some, some dark days before Mr. Vinnick came in and and really just changed the culture um, and really got involved in the community. And no, these last, you know, eight, nine years have just been, been amazing. Now, I had the chance to interview Martin St. Louis and I asked him about you and obviously, you know, nothing but great things. He's, he talks about how he learned a lot from you, but I asked, I asked Marty, what was the plan the first year? Obviously Barry Melrose was the head coach for you when you first came in, because he said, you know, the plan was for you not to play until they put you out there on the ice and they couldn't take you off anymore. Had they discussed kind of a plan when you were initially drafted about what, what they were going to do with you? No, that was the thing. There was no plan. I mean, I was coming in as, as a first overall pick. I wanted to make the team. Uh, I made the team and started out on a second line with Ryan Malone and Redeem Verbata. And obviously had Marty and Vinny on the first line. And, you know, I was thinking I'd come in and, you know, it, everything would be, you know, great. And then I think the first game we actually started over in Czech Republic that year. Um, so I think I played like eight or nine minutes and then the second game was like seven minutes. And then we flew home and my home opener uh, was against Carolina. My parents were able to come. They weren't able to go overseas. So they came to that game. And I think I played like three minutes. And I remember Gary Roberts sitting next to me on the bench and he had played, you know, three minutes as well. And he kind of jokingly tapped me on the shoulder. He said, well, kid, I guess they're saving us for the playoffs. (laughs) And and then I think he stormed off the ice after the game and broke a stick and ran into Barry Melrose office. And there was a big argument. And obviously I had no, uh, no inkling of what was going to happen, you know, at the beginning of that season. And it just, it just didn't go very well. Our team wasn't, you know, playing very well. I think after 16 games, Barry Melrose got fired and Rick Tockett took over. And that's when the transition really started to happen. And, you know, I was an 18 year old kid. Obviously I needed to get a little bigger and stronger and adapt to, to the game. It was a little different back then. There was still uh, a lot of, you know, clutching and grabbing and the physical aspect. So it, it was tough for sure. But I think the plan with, uh, with Rick Tockett was, okay, we're going to try to get you stronger. You're going to play three games then you're going to sit one and do a workout and then play three and then sit one. I mean, as if that was really going to make me stronger. Right. Like, <laughs> but by doing one extra workout, but you know, you're, like I said, you're young, you just do what you're told. And then it just got to a point we did that three rotations. And then I think I had like a hat trick or two goal game. And then I played and then had another great game. And then I was playing with Marty and then things just, things just took off the last half of that year. And, um, but I, I do give credit to, to Rick Tockett. He really, 
kind of saw the the potential and, and saw how hard I was working and realized, okay, we don't need to actually stick to that, uh, to that structure and, and things just kind of flourished from there. Uh, I've had a ton of people ask me this question. Um, so you're the first player I've had on this year. So you're the guy I'm asking it to. Uh, how did Gravy Train start? Who started playing it? How did it, how did it take off? And, and do you love it? Yeah, well, we, uh, we, we all love it now. I mean, that, that song is going to be uh, in the back of our heads forever um, in association with winning the Stanley Cup. But it was actually the big cat, Andre Vasilevsky, kind of brought that song. You know, each year we, we pick a new win song. And it was he's like, you got to listen to this song. And he kind of played it in our room with one of our trainers. And we were like, that's, that's so weird. Like, what kind of song is that? And then it just kind of grew and grew and we're like, you know what? Screw it. Like, let's, let's, let's have that as our wind song. And, and then ironically we go to Sweden and young gravy is there and we got to meet him. And it was just like this whole experience just kind of came together. And he's from Tampa, um, isn't he? Yeah. I think he's from around somewhere uh, yeah. i'm not exactly sure but yeah he's, he's from the tampa area i think so it was just it was just crazy how it all interconnected and worked out and then we go on to win the cup and we have gravy train so we actually thought about you're like should we just keep this song going for this year but it was you know we're like okay hey, we got some new guys it's it's a new team it's a new journey let's switch up the song but that uh, that song will uh, forever be enshrined in tampa bay lightning history Absolutely. Now, who picked the song this year? Um, this year was more of a uh, collab a voting. St- yeah, collab. We had uh, our little group chat going and guys were um, putting their their picks. And then we kind of had a little uh, little vote. But usually it's funny. Vasilevsky, uh, he has a lot of input. That's that's really the only time he's he gets really uh, involved in that t- in those sort of things. <laughs> Uh, now I've had the, uh, obviously the pleasure of interviewing everybody on the team and Girardi, uh, when he played with you, he seemed to be heavily annoyed by your involvement with fantasy sports. Uh, I think, I don't know if McDonough's <laughs> involved. I know Mikey, the trainer, uh, how'd you do in fantasy football this year? Uh, I didn't do very well. I'm in two leagues and one with my buddies back home, one with the boys here in our team and disappointing year. I'm, I'm really disappointed because you know, G's right. I, I take that very seriously. So it was hilarious. We'd get on him and Callahan all the time talking about trades in the training room and they'd get so annoyed at us. Um, cause like the trades would never actually happen. We, we talk about these huge blockbuster trades. We talked to, you know, for half an hour about this trade and they would just go stir crazy in there. And finally they're like, you, you guys know, you're not going to make this trade. So just like get it, get out of the room. So it was, uh, we actually recruited Cali though. We got him into the league eventually. So he, he broke, he, he cracked Cali, but G G had, uh, other tough, things to do. Yeah. He's a tough guy we to crack. Yeah. We couldn't get him. Who won the league? Who won the team league that you were in this year? Did McDonough win? Um, no, I want to say it was a couple. So our trainer, Mikey, who started this league, he still has a couple friends from um, that aren't involved in the team that were right. that are, are still in the league. So one of his buddies won, but I think Hetty Hetty made it pretty far. He, he was either in the semifinals or finals, which is huge for him because the only football that he understands is soccer. <laughs> um, so hey. I'll give him credit though. Like Hetty's Hetty's in the ba- our baseball fantasy. He's in our football fantasy, and like he had no clue about any of those sports or players or teams. So uh, he's come a long way. That's how you learn, though. That's what I tell everybody. That's the best way to learn For about sure. a, the sport is to play it. So you're not. Yeah, in- I mean, you play you play one year of fantasy, and then you're ripping guys' names off that are you know the the normal fan doesn't even know. So now you're not in fantasy hockey, are you? No, not in fantasy hockey. Okay. Um, a lot of friends that are in fantasy hockey. A lot of text messages that I get, like, "Hey, you guys, uh, how you how you feeling? How's Palat feeling tonight? You think Pointer's <laughs> gonna score? Like, you gonna score one on the power play tonight?" So, 
Hey, listen, speaking of Hetty, I want to know, it's obviously going around social media right now, his Undertaker look that he had, you know, getting on the plane. Uh, what did you think about that when you saw that? Were you already boarding or did you did you see him first when he got on the plane? What did you think about that whole look? Well, it's funny because he had actually, he FaceTimed me before we left uh, for the for the airport. And he, he wanted to know if I wanted to, jump in with them. Uh, but I was already doing something, but he had that hat on and I was like, what are you wearing, man? He's like, Oh, I'm just trying out a few looks. <laughs> and I was like, what? But here's the, here's the story. He's now that he's, he's, uh, he's buckled under the Alex Kalorn influencer, Instagram pressure yeah. and just got a new Instagram account that is public now. Wow. So, you know what? Now, <clears throat> now he's got to live up to to that lifestyle, right? So all of a sudden, I mean, he's been a guy, I've been a a, a huge like I would never beat that influencer life is not for me and Hetty's always been on my, on my side. And now he's been turned and now he's trying out outfits before he goes on the road. He's wearing, you know, his his hat, he had the Undertaker, Johnny Cash, whatever you want to call it, uh look going on so i think he's really trying to up his game in the influencer world to gain some more followers so that's what it was all about you know what that's crazy because and we're going to be playing the audio uh, of hetty on this pod on the podcast because he said on this podcast last year that he was done with instagram that he hadn't posted in four years and he saw no right. reason to be on social media whatsoever and now look at him well, I'm glad you have that clip maybe send it to me later so i can remind him as well <laughs> you don't own a cowboy hat do you I do not no. yeah. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, now I want to talk, obviously this, I know a lot of people talk to you about the bubble. Uh, you know, there's a great shot of you walking onto the plane, leaving for Toronto. Uh, everybody was getting hyped up about it because we knew that you were pr doing a little bit of practicing. What, what, were, what were you, what were you under the impression of when you boarded the flight to go to the Toronto bubble that you were going to play in every game, including the round Robin games? Pretty much. I mean, that, that was the intention was I was going to go there, obviously have a couple practices and then, you know, at, at least try to get in a couple of those um, round robin games. So that, that was the intention. I mean, I, I had, you know, worked extremely hard to get to a point where I thought I was comfortable. And then we got to the bubble. Everything was great. We had a couple practices and then, you know, kind of had uh some hiccups in terms of the rehab and how I was feeling. And, and then it was, okay, well, you know, maybe try to play the last game in the round Robin. And then it was like, okay, maybe try to get in, you know, halfway through the first round or if we can get to the second round and then it just kind of snowballed. And it was tough because, you know, in a, in a normal year, you can go out and, and maybe see a specialist or, you know, get some extra imaging done or do some rehab away from, you know, the team just little things like that that you kind of take for granted but once you're in the bubble you're in the bubble you know you, you can't you can't leave if you need to get a even an extra mri or something like it's just this huge drawn out process and you know it takes days to get completed and it, it was just crazy in that regard so that that put a hamper on things for sure and then it just kind of snowballed from there um and it was it, it was just tough but uh you know, obviously it worked out in, in the end, but my intentions to answer your question. Yeah. I was expecting to play. When you were in the bubble, did it start to creep in the thought of what if they win the Stanley cup and I don't play? You know what? That never really crept in my head. I, I think once we got um, to the conference finals, you know, I was really, really grinding away and, at that point, it's like, okay, we're going to do everything possible to get in there. And, you know, I knew, I knew I needed surgery at the end of the year, regardless. Um, I wasn't going to put myself in a position where it was like something was going to get extremely worse and career ending or anything like that. We knew what, what procedure needed to be done. We knew, yeah, I could make it a little worse, but it, it wasn't going to be anything that wasn't fixable. And, you know, then it was a kind of a pain tolerance type of thing. And I didn't want to be a liability if I got out there on the ice. So when I strapped up in that game three, again, the intention was, okay, I'm playing game three in the rest of the series. So 
you know, that, that thought never crept into my head. I, I knew I wanted to get out there in some capacity. Um, if I didn't and we still won, I, I mean, I don't know. I still would have been, you know, as happy as I was. Um, but I was definitely glad that I got out there. And then to score that goal was was pretty amazing. Well, when that shot left your stick, I mean, is it the thing like in baseball where you know you got one or do you not? Do you know that that's going in right away? Well, it, it felt really nice coming off the stick. Like you said, it's like, you know, when you crush a, a ball in baseball, you don't even feel the ball, you know, whether you, you take your driver out and just crush a drive and you're like, wow, that's going to be, that's going to go far. It was just one of those moments, obviously in hockey, things happen a lot quicker. As soon as it left my stick, I, I, I knew it was going to be in a spot where I wanted it to be, you know, the goalie was cheating a little bit and, but it was, it was just amazing that that all that moment just kind of built up to that. And uh, I've been talking about it before. It was one of those where, you know, I'm not a huge believer in things are meant to be or happen for a reason. I think, you know, you work for what you get, but obviously I, I worked extremely hard to get that, but it just, for whatever reason, it just felt like that was kind of like a meant to be moment. Well, now, once you guys won the cup and you got back to Tampa Bay, and I don't know if, you know, through social media or whatever, but could you feel the the impact that you had on this community just by going, even just by going out there, even if you didn't score, but by scoring that goal? I mean, I was at Amelie working with some people. I mean, it was just, it's a moment that people will never, ever forget. They'll never stop telling their families, you know, about that. Is that is that something that, that you ever think about? Does that ever kind of touch you? Yeah. I mean, I, it kind of got chills just, just hearing you say that. I, I don't think you, for me, I, I think of it that way until you hear, you know, people talk about it and how they relate to it and, and, you know, how special it was for them too. So that's, that's a really surreal when, when I hear people say that. And um, it, it was just, like I said, it was an amazing, amazing experience to go out there and be with the guys and obviously score that goal and, help your team win a game and create some momentum. It was, um, I don't think I'll ever truly like know just how impactful that was. It's just, you're just for you, for you in the moment, you're a hockey player, you're going out, you're doing, you know, the thing that you love, you're doing the thing that you do best for me. I, I like scoring goals and I scored a goal, but you know, maybe down the road when, when you really look back at that moment and just kind of really appreciate how, how special it was. Who would you say was the MVP of the Stanley Cup celebration? Well, without a doubt, Cooch. Oh, okay, okay. I thought yeah. I thought Big Rig might be up for that award, also. You know what? Big Rig was up for it, but that's Big Rig. Like that, that is him. We see that on a daily basis. So for us, you know, we know the type of personality that Patty brings, and you know, it's that likable, lovable, big teddy bear personality. And who likes to have a good time, especially, you know, back-to-back champs that we've heard a million times now. <laughs> um, but we, what we don't see a lot and what uh, I know the fans certainly don't see a lot is Cooch kind of out of his element. And, you know, when, when we were at Raymond James and he was pouring the beer down Mr. Vinnick's throat, I mean, that was like, that picture will forever be ingrained in, uh, in my mind of just, you know, we were just, dying hysterically laughing that he was doing that and he was he was just a little kid I mean uh, again you know when when something like that happens where that's your ultimate dream since you were a little kid you almost lose you know sense of what's happening it's just pure raw emotion that are coming out when something like that happens I mean you just lose control of your body and your mind sometimes um (laughs) And certainly the booze helped him a little bit as well, but it was, it was amazing to see just Cooch kind of let go and obviously he deserved it. He, he he's, he's played amazing and had an amazing playoff run too, but he was in my mind, the MVP of uh, the celebrations for sure. How's Cooch doing? Have you, uh, you checking in with him? Yeah, he's doing great. I think even better than, than expected. I know it was really tough for him to, have to you know have the surgery and and miss the 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 season um you know especially coming off you know the stanley cup win he wanted to get out there but in talking to him as much as i have i know it was the right call for him he feels like 10 times better than than what he did so 
things are going really well on that front. And hopefully, you know, we get ourselves in a position where we're in the playoffs at the end of the year and he can use all this time to rehab and get ready and, and hopefully be back and, and be the same old cooch that we know. That, that's what we're rooting for. Is there is there a story with uh, Pat Maroon's fedora? I heard it was like one of the players' wives or something. Is that is that true or is that his fedora? I think it was uh, Ryan McDonough's wife. Yeah, okay. Kaylee. I think I think it was her hat, um, which now is uh, all over uh, t-shirts and you know hats. Yeah. And I think she's probably calling in to get some royalties off uh, some of the merchandise <laughs> since that was her hat. So I think I think it was hers for sure. It was it was someone's hat. But I think it was Kaylee McDonough's hat. That's what I've heard. Um, you know, I, we've seen you at the Bucks game. You took the Stanley Cup to the Bucks game. You were eating popcorn out of it. You met Giselle. Have you had the chance to meet Tom Brady yet? No, I haven't had a chance to physically meet him yet. Um, we've exchanged a lot of messages since he's been here in, in Tampa. We actually have a, a mutual friend. So uh, when he was thinking about signing here, I kind of had the inside scoop that uh, he was looking for a, a place to live and where to live and where to be in Tampa. So I was trying to facilitate that uh, the best that I could. Um, but obviously with Corona and all that stuff and, and the, the, the busy schedules, I mean, I, I don't want to bug him, but yeah. he's uh, he's been a huge part of, of the success that they've had. And, you know, coincidentally or not, since he signed here, Tampa sports is kind of blown up. So I don't know if it's just the winning ways of Tom Brady that uh, have helped us or just a coincidence, but no, looking I, I, forward to looking forward to watching them hopefully play a Super Bowl in Tampa. Absolutely. I'm going to give your goal more credit for uh, bringing all this to Tampa Bay than I am Tom Brady right now, <laughs> but that's, you know, listen, that's just me. Uh, Steven Stamkos, when you were in the bubble and you're watching the lightning play night after night, was there anybody that impressed you uh, just because you had a different perspective of watching anybody that maybe you learned something from that you didn't know because you know, you're kind of in the mix uh, or, you know, you already knew everything about your teammates before. No, it, it, it was such a unique experience. Um, I think it was great for our team. We, we had a really close team to begin with. Um, but I think when you're thrown into that situation where you're literally with each other pretty much every second of the day um, and just the guys that we had brought in at the deadline, I think that was that pause was kind of big for us. Um because, you know, especially I think if you ask like Coleman and Goudreau, you get thrown into the mix of the trade deadline. You don't really know the guys. And then you have a, you know, a couple of weeks before playoffs start. So that pause really helped those guys get comfortable um, in their surroundings, comfortable with the guys on the team. Once we got back going, I think that line with, with the Gordo obviously was really an X factor for, for our team. And I think, you know, probably looking back, it's tough to say who impressed you the most. Obviously, you know, you look at, you know, the, the four studs that we have in Cooch and Pointer and Vassy and Hetty. I mean, those guys impressed me every single night still. And they played like, you know, the amazing players that they were. But I look at that line, you know, with Goody and Coles and, and Gordo, and they were really, to me, an X factor line in terms of, some of the big goals that they scored or just creating chaos on the ice. Um, you know, Coleman and, and Goody on the PK being unbelievable out there killing penalties. So I, I was really impressed with, with those guys. Gordo had that, you know, kind of a breakout playoffs in terms of he was struggling a little to score goals in the regular season, kind of put that, it was kind of wearing on him and he comes out in the playoffs. And I think he had like seven goals in, in the playoffs. So those guys played extremely well. The other guys that I mentioned played great too, but the expectation is that they play great. Um, so it, it really was just, just a team effort and it was fun to watch and just fun to be, have that camaraderie every single night, especially when things are going well. It was, it was really special. Have you teared up watching the replay of yourself holding up the Stanley cup or is that just for us fans? <laughs> No, I, I don't know if I've teared up, but I, I will say this. It, it was amazing. It kind of caught me off guard with just the, the raw emotion as soon as we won. Um, and even before we had put our hands on the cup, just the celebration, you know, when everyone mobs Vassy on, on the ice, you know, 
I had some really, really emotional interactions with, with guys. I think with Shaddy and McDonough are the two that kind of really caught me off guard with just the raw emotions of, of winning. And obviously two veteran guys, you know, myself, a veteran guy, you work your whole career to do something like that. So, you know, you think you're this, you know, raw, raw, tough athlete and, you know, if you ever win, it's just going to be, you know, popping champagne and beer and this and that. But it, it again, something you, you really can't control, just those raw emotions coming out. So it was it was pretty, pretty amazing. Who used the cup the most this offseason? Like who would call up Brian Breesman and go, hey, I'm going out to dinner. I need the cup. Was it killer? But did he say killer? Do, uh, yeah, killer. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, he had it. That was, again, a unique thing that, you know, obviously it sucked. We weren't really able to have our our days with the cup and bring it back to our hometown so we're hoping that maybe we can do that um next summer i mean we just have to win the cup again and then we won't have to worry about figuring that out right but that kind of sucked the good thing was it stayed in tampa the whole off season and i stayed in tampa a lot of guys stayed in tampa the whole off season which which was rare so we could have the opportunity to to you know call up whether it was Breezer or Bill Wicked or whoever and say, Hey, I, you know, I want to go golfing today. Can we bring the cup out? Hey, I want to go, you know, have uh, some people over for dinner. Can we bring the cup over? So that was, that was really cool. But I think killer by far uh, probably used up uh, his, uh, his Stanley cup coupons the most. <laughs> He had it like every other week. He was on the golf course here. He was in his backyard there. Another golf course here. So he he had fun with it. Yeah, I'm afraid not everybody got a day with the cup because I only saw it with Killer. That's what I was concerned yeah, about. Seriously, seriously. Uh, but uh, Well, listen, Stephen, I, I appreciate this. I'm going to let you off the hook with this one question. Everybody's answered this. And just so you know, everybody's had you in their answer, whether it's Andrew, <laughs> Chuck, Vinny, Martin St. Louis. I want to know, give me your all-time lightning starting lineup. Wow, that's uh, that's a great question. I will go. I'm not gonna put myself in it, okay? Just because mm. I wanna. I mean, like, come on, it's, it's a tough one. Put yourself All time in start, there. So, okay, so what? Three forwards, two D, and a goalie. Yeah. Okay, I'll start with Vassy. Okay. I'll go uh, Victor Hedman and Dan Boyle. I'll go right now. I'll say Marty, myself. And then this is where it gets really interesting because it's either Cooch or Vinny. Yep. And I think Cooch will be there for sure. Um, but I'll say Vinny for now okay. just because of, of everything that's gone on. But, I mean, that's a, uh, that's, that's a toss up. If I uh, listen, it's easier if I just exclude myself and I put uh, Marty, Vinny and, and Cooch. So that's I'll, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll let that. you can exclude yourself for this one. <laughs> I, Cause I appreciate you answering. And I will say that you and Marty are actually, I believe the only guys that have had uh headman and Boyle paired up together. I think a lot of people have skipped over Dan Boyle, but, uh, but yeah. not Marty and not you. Yeah, what are what are some what are some other uh, of the picks? It's really it's really like you said it's a combination. I mean, you know, somebody put Girardi and, and Coburn in there, you know, back. You know, <laughs> it's it's a, it's a whole combination of different things here. But like Dave Andrea Chuck had um, Ben Bishop as goalie. Um, yeah. There was uh, a couple of guys had. Um, uh, you know what? Marty had uh, Javi Bulin as the goalie because yeah. he won the Stanley Cup. So you know he might right. he might change that to Vazzy now. So well, yeah, I think I get the. Uh the easier one now because we've won the cup so you can you know you can put big cat in there for sure but uh no there's been some amazing players that have obviously played and and more i mean i think as we go you're gonna have the argument of of pointer uh i'm sure and cooch for sure yep. and so it, it it'll be it'll be fun when it's all said and done hey look either way you're not getting knocked off my list or probably anybody else's so <laughs> listen uh stammer thank you so much for taking time uh, i've uh, you know we've had 48 episodes of the block party and i've been trying to get you on for every single one and we're kicking off this season and i appreciate you agreeing to do it uh thank you so much for taking the time and, and good luck this year yeah no problem thanks for having me glad uh, we worked it out this time thanks stammer